Okay. So um, thank you again uh, for joining um, and taking the time out of your day. This is session number two of our Lunch and Learn. Um, if you haven't already joined us on our LinkedIn groups or Facebook groups, or if you don't have our information as far as email goes, feel free to take a screenshot of, uh, of this screen here. I know some of these links are quite a, quite a handful. So um, uh, the session today, uh, talking about uh, pricing strategies for consultants. I've been working in consulting for over 15 years um, in technology consulting. And a as I was um, coming up with um, kind of content for this, for this talk, I was just brainstorming things out. And just there were a lot of different topics I wanted to talk about. But since we wanted to stay, you know, keep it a pretty focused uh, 20 minutes, I thought it would be a great idea to sort of deep dive into like one topic. And pricing is a topic that's, that's super important. For, for consultants in general, but one thing that um, uh, some of the ideas that, that I had with uh, and some of the strategies that I put into play, um, I wanted to talk about um, the concept of time is not money and just sort of how that kind of comes into play. Um, just a little bit about me, uh, background. So I'm um, uh, uh, from the class of 2003. I think we were the first class of the school of, of the school of ICS. Before that was the the department of ICS. Um, had a, uh, got a minor in management as well. Uh, started working in the business process automation space in 2000. So that's if you're doing the math. That was before I graduated. I actually started as an intern for a software company when I was 18. Uh, the, the summer after my sophomore year. Um, held a variety of roles. Um, so I went from software engineering over to professional services and consulting. Spent about five years there. After that, went into product management. Uh, this is all within the same company. Um, and was uh, headed up the development, um, the product management and development of the flagship product that actually I was an engineer for uh, earlier in my career. Um, uh, Spent about 12 years at that company um, and um, uh, started this company in 2013. Um, and essentially, we do, you know, it's almost like a continuation from a, um, uh, from a, a, a professional services perspective uh, in, in sort of that, uh, that same business. Um, uh, really uh, started as a one man band, now like a three, man, three person band. Um, still a small uh, a services provider, um, but uh, working in sort of the enterprise um, software space. So um, getting right into it, um, wanted to talk about to sort of frame the frame the problem set as far as like what's what are the problems with um, hourly based uh, pricing? And so, um, you know, I think when 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 you look at sort of consulting and and sort of the the, the phrase of time is money. The easiest thing to do is to sort of say, okay, well, what's your rate? Um, and, and to be able to say, well, you know, like whatever X number of dollars an hour is sort of how you price your, your projects. And so um, as you get into consulting, if you go that route, one of the first things you figure out is, well, there's only so much time you can bill, especially if you're one person. So um, it's, it's really difficult to scale. Um, you have to sleep, you have to eat. Um, and, and really, um, there are only 24 hours in a day. So yeah, that's just, it just becomes really difficult to scale. Um, when you get into implementing and you become really fast and really good with what you do, by having that hourly based sort of like, um, uh, uh, that hourly based rate, you end up leaving money on the table. So um, if you are fast, um, you might wanna look at uh, different structures and we're gonna, that's exactly what we're gonna get into. But you do end up leaving money on the table if you follow sort of normal, normal um, industry rates. If you're slow, so if you're, if you're t you yourself, and I've seen companies do this repeatedly, they're coming into a new product and they're trying to understand how to implement this product, but they don't know quite how to do it. And so there's a little bit of a learning curve on the project. And so they budget that and say, well, you know, it's gonna take us maybe 20%, 25% longer to do this certain thing. And when you apply a rate to that, you end up pricing yourself out of the project altogether because you're just way too expensive. So that's, that's another problem with going that sort of route. Um, when you apply that, that hourly based rate, you, you end up being uh, commoditized. So you, you know, your, your, your customers look at you as, as kind of the same type of resource as everyone else in the industry or everyone else in that space that's vying for that business. 
So how do you sort of like combat that? What's the, what's the, the foil to that, um, to that approach? And so I look at this as not just fixed price, like a fixed price bid, but being a value-based bid as well. So um, when, I, when I talk about value and when we under, well, first off, we need to understand and define what value is and charge accordingly. So when I think about value, I think about the benefits that my solution or my services are going to um, uh, generate within my customer. So when I think about benefits, so to sort of defining what those are, it really revolves around four things. So it's um, what sort of increased revenues I'm going to enable for my customer. Uh, it's gonna be what sort of costs am I going to help my customers contain or um, help them cut costs in general. Um, three, it's going to be the productivity that they have in their business. So key employees, key business processes, um, and in improving productivity in, in, uh, in those areas. And four is improved compliance. So um, keeping, <laughs> keeping executives out of jail. So those are like the four main benefits. If I'm talking to an economic buyer, and actually just from a sales perspective, that's a super important thing is to talk in, sen in the sense of benefits versus, you know, a lot of times we talk about features and like speeds and feeds. We could probably do a whole, a whole nother uh, a session on, on benefits versus features. But um, if you, if you um, articulate your solution and your services in sort of in respect to those benefits, then you start to really understand the value. And so um, by, so first you understand the value and you put a dollar amount on that and then you charge consummate to that value and, and making sure that you are capturing as much value as, as, as possible. Um, in that whole value discussion as well, um, you know, you kind of need to factor in the competition. So what your competitors are doing, what maybe not even like the other firms, but what is, uh, what is the alternative for your customer to your solution? So it might even be doing nothing and what, you know, what's the cost of that as well. Um, the perception, so the perception of the solution you're, or the problem you're trying to, the solution to the problem you're trying to fulfill, um, is, it, uh, is it a critical problem or is it, you know, a luxury problem? Um, if it's mission critical, it has a higher value. Just, that's just sort of like the, the, the rule of thumb there. When you value base um, uh, and, and, and you have a value based fixed price, you actually tend to align your motivations with your customers' motivations when you fulfill the project. So for example, if I had a fixed price on a project, my motivation as a, as a consultant is one, to finish quickly and to finish with high quality so I don't have churn and I don't have this repeated rework. That's actually the exact same motivation. Your customers want the exact same thing. They want it quick and they want it done well. Um, if I'm fixed bidding a, pro a project, I want a stable scope. I want it to be like no variability. I want it to be, you know, I get in, get out, and I'm able to maximize my profit and maximize the time that I spend. Um, again, your customer wants a stable scope. They don't want to be surprised with change requests and things like that. They, they also want that. Um, also, uh, as an implementer, I want uh, repeatable proven solutions. So again, reducing the amount of churn and your customers want the exact same thing. So when you structure a project that way, you actually align your motivations and your customers' motivations. Um, so here's some reasons. So talked about profitability. The second point here, um, you actually, when you get into the discovery process, you actually, and you, you, you try to come up with and understand the scope of the project so that you can do a fixed price and a, a, a value-based fixed price. Um, you actually display to your customer, you show your customer that you understand them because you're, you're really digging into the problem. You, you're digging into why they want to implement, you know, that solution. And I think that, that there go, there's a lot, um, that goes a long way. Uh, when you um, when you do that with your customer, um, talked a little bit about on the job training. So, if you um, uh, price according to value, uh, then um, it doesn't matter sort of how long it takes. So, if you um, say, "Hey, I'm charging five thousand dollars to do this," um, uh, there might be some investment time on my side. So, uh, 
the fact that you're learning on the job doesn't um, affect uh, your um, your customers um, uh, the price tag uh, for your customer so you can actually learn on the job um, by fixing a price your customers feel more secure a lot of people say this is like a an insurance policy for your customer uh, because this is the price and you know don't worry about um, any increases if, if the scope stays the same um, and because of a lot of uh, a lot of uh, services companies tend to charge by hour, you, you do differentiate yourself. You, you become known as someone who's confident with, with what you're proposing and um, you can um, sort of uh, uh, take a you know, kind of a, an elevated position in your, in your prospects and your customer's mind. Um, a couple of examples of um, uh, projects where this worked out well for, uh, for us. Um, we had a, a recent project where this was something that was really easy for us to do. We've done it time and, you know, like this one, uh, this one project many, many times. So it was easy for us, but not for the customer. Uh, we fixed bid it. Um, it was a pretty quick project, but essentially we, we got 6.6 .6, uh, times the industry rate when you broke, when you break down the amount of revenue to the amount of time spent. So just, um, and it, if you come, if you, you know, uh, uh, take your rate, your normal rate or the normal industry rate and multiply it times six, your customer is going to look at it and say, no, you're six times more expensive. So um, uh, going, the, going the, um, the fixed bid route was definitely the right fit for that project. Um, we also had another project that was a, a pretty high risk proof of concept for a digital mailroom implementation. Um, the customer wanted a below standard hourly rate um, they negotiated a, um, a rate that was pretty low with their customers. So we were subs on the project. Uh, the timeline was pretty aggressive, um, but talking through the project and understanding what was needed, um, I, I believe that we were able to, to deliver it pretty quickly and, and um, uh, do it in a, in a way that was a high quality uh, delivery. And so we were actually able, so I, I actually negotiated a pretty, um, uh, a low rate when you throw a, a low um, fixed bid when you think about how our customer projected how long it would take for them to do it. And so um, we delivered on time. Um, we delivered actually uh, with a 40% margin for us. And so kind of in the end, everyone was happy. We got our margin, our customer, uh, who's the prime on the project, um, made their money, uh, the customer got something on, you know, got their delivery on time and, and everyone was, everyone was pretty satisfied with it. Um, so that's good. Um, so John, I, I, thanks for the question. I will um, make sure that we answer that question in the Q and A section, but thank you. Um, so it's not all, it's not all um, uh, perfect. <laughs> so what, what are the, what sort of things should we watch out for and where this doesn't actually work out? So if you've got risk in the project, going fixed bid is just, it's, it's dangerous, right? So uh, the, it's all about risk mitigation and making sure that you don't take on that risk without um, either, you know, you're either you de-risk it, you prototype it out, you change the structure of your project, or you just add, you know, even I wouldn't even think adding adding buffer enough buffer you know uh, uh, might be a good way to go about it but just careful with the risk um, variability if there's a lot of change with the project if it's something that you haven't done before there are a lot of different variations of it that's a risk to implementing or going with this uh, sort of um, going with this sort of a uh, uh, bid structure if the customer um, if there's a lot of overhead. So if the customer wants to do daily conference calls or, you know, um, a lot of emails and just like, there's just a lot of administrative overhead, that's just going to eat into your profits. Um, misplaced expectations. So a lot of times I run into a scenario where um, uh, uh, what was sold, <laughs> unfortunately, from, when it comes to the product, um, might have been sold differently than what's the reality for the, for the implementation. Um, so, when you have those misplaced expectations, um, then there's a lot of risk that there will be churn in the, um, in the execution and the services side. Also, if you have a team that's underperforming, um, maybe you've got folks that um, are uh, not as senior or not trained enough to be able to execute to a standard 
um, sort of delivery model, then again, that's just sort of eats up eats up your um, eats up your your margin. Um, so this is sort of the approach when I think about like how I strategize my pricing and and how I want to evolve the projects that I've been on and sort of um, uh, like the pricing structures. So I have sort of, you'd see like on the Y axis, the value to the customer on the X axis is sort of like the risk and cost, uh, risk to us and cost to us, the implementers. And so as you go to the right, that's the higher risk. So the big red is you want to avoid those sections, av avoid those types of projects, uh, if at all possible. So staying away from low value. And also as the risk gets higher, your risk tolerance and the value tolerance becomes higher as well. But there's still room for cases where you want to take on uh, high risk, high value projects. Um, uh, and you know maybe it's strategic for your business. But the, the strategy there is you take those on uh, more on a TNM and hourly basis, and then you try to drive out the variability and risk and then try to move to the left, right? Move the cost and move the risk over to the left. So let's kind of dig into each one of those. I'm gonna dig into those three and then that'll be kind of it for the session. Uh, then we can go into Q and A. Um, so um, when you get to the high risk, high uh, value. So I, I, I would recommend a time and materials hourly or per diem uh, bid structure. And really the goal there is to sort of con like start your oper to start to operationalize those types of projects and build your intellectual property. So you want to understand the problem space, you want to understand the value prop, the, the value chain, who are the different players involved, who are the customers, who are the partners, um, understand your firm's capabilities, right? Do you need to scale up on certain programming uh, languages, uh, scale up on certain, you know, on, on the cloud, on AI, things like that. Um, understand that and then start to, again, build in your, uh, your IP. So whether that's code, uh, code that you can deploy in future, um, future projects, uh, processes for, um, you know, what questions to ask in, at the outset of projects for requirements gathering, um, um, and also just kind of building up that institutional knowledge. Um, as you get into sort of more to the left, right? So this is sort of mid range from a risk perspective. Um, I would suggest a, a bid structure that's, that is value-based fixed price, but has a TNM um, aspect to it for variability. So um, you start to create standardized offerings with limited custom, uh, customizability. So let's say you're always going to address, you know, like invoice processing, right? So you start to have sort of an invoice processing solution, an invoice processing based project. And then, right, you might have some customization sort of above and beyond that. But for the most part, you know that you're going to um, uh, bid your projects with this range or, or you know, have a, have a price tag there. Um, you start to train your staff um, on your production process. Again, continue to improve your capabilities and drive out variability. Um, again, trying to bring that that cost and risk risk profile down, and then just continue building uh, intellectual property. And so, once you get uh, more and more reps and more and more repeatability, you're able to essentially productize your services and productize uh, your IP. And so. Um, you want to get as repeatable as, as, as possible from a pre-sales, post-sales and fulfillment process. Uh, you want to drive out as much uh, customizability and deviation from the process. Um, if at all possible, have standard part numbers and prices. And then at that point, it'd be, um, uh, it would make sense to kind of extend out distribution to partners and other firms so that you can again, get more sort of sales scale, if you will. Um, I've done this with a um, uh, back when I was with that software company. We actually built a lot of reusable um, modules, which are add-ons to product. And we had a small a small team, and we we um, we had uh, uh, seven-figure sales numbers annually, and it was it was amazing. So uh, we were able to see, essentially productize our IP over the course of many many projects. But then we were able to get it to where, you know, you basically bought it off a price list. Um, all right. I think I did fairly well with time. Um, we've got nine minutes left. I'm going to hit 
some of the questions here. So um, on the um, on the chat. So first question for the fixed price bid: How did you manage attempted expanding scope? So um, really, it just comes down to you just got to be vigilant. So if scope um, scope creep happens, you sort of know, hey, this is out of scope. You have that conversation with your customer and you say, hey, um, this is out of scope. Um, we need a change request. Um, also, just kind of inoculating your customers up front and just say, um, if and when we do have change um, in this project, then we're gonna, you know, we're gonna need um, to go back to the well. So just to be completely um, uh, transparent about that. Um, how Omar, would you just really quick? Uh, yeah. We just wanted to notify everybody on the call that these questions are recorded and will be posted. So if anyone has an objection to the recording, please uh, send a message so we can edit it out. But otherwise, this will be recorded and posted online. Cool. Yeah, thanks. Thanks, Pooja. Uh, another question. How would you determine price for professional training, um, professional certification, payment terms, especially when dealing with foreign company partners? Ooh, that's a great question. Um, so I think that um, part of that uh, comes down to what what is the the benefit for um, uh, for the customer. Uh, maybe compare it to other um, uh, products or other training that uh, is in the industry. Um, foreign company partners. That that's. Um, that's a tough one because then you start getting into different, you know, currencies. I've seen where um, you have essentially a global price list where, um, uh, depending on the geo, you have uh, the price in that um, in that local currency. Um, again, that there there are contracts that kind of come into play when it's like, well, how you know, can you have a contract in? Um, in, in, you know, the EU and, and all, you know, all the other geos, that's a lot of that's a, a sort of a legal kind of, you know, structure that you might need to deal with that I might, I'm, I'm probably not the, the, the most qualified to get into, get into those, those types of questions, but um, email me if you have any questions and also we can, we can dig into more of that as well. Um, new consultant, when you are a new consultant, what pricing stra pricing strategy do you recommend? So if you're starting, um, you know, I, I think that um, I would look at um, uh, definitely fixed pricing things when you're starting, but understanding your capabilities and knowing that you're going to um, invest some time. So when you're starting out, it's gonna take you longer to do things. Um, and I think it's actually very uh, beneficial to do a fixed price because it, it, and being completely honest with your customer and say, hey, this is the first time I've done this. Um, uh, you know, I wanna make sure that I get, uh, you know, that, that I deliver value to you. Uh, so, um, you know, this is gonna be the fixed price. It doesn't matter how long it's gonna take me to do it, um, but this is gonna be your price. So I, I'd suggest that structure is probably the best way to go. Um, Based on my experience, do you have do I have a recommendation on for a new consultant? Um, that's or is it dependent on client? Um, yeah, I think so. I think that's um, uh, I would say it's based you know based on the based on the value or based on the project that you're gonna you're gonna provide or the the the, um, the solution. I would I would center it around that. So you know whether it's if you're building a custom. AI model, that's going to be one price than if you're setting up a WordPress website, right? So it's, it does, I would say it doesn't matter your experience level more than it is like the, the value that your end customer is going to get. Um, uh, yes. So uh, uh, this will be yeah posted to YouTube. You'll be able to revisit the presentation. Absolutely. Um, would payment in advance be a reasonable requirement? Absolutely. So I, <laughs> I want to do another session on negotiations, but so I would say as a consultant, one of the biggest, one of the biggest things is being ultra, ultra aggressive, maybe not aggressive, but being proactive and being very protective over your cash flow. So advanced payment when at all possible, very, um, you know, uh, favorable, favorable payment terms when at all possible. Um, the standard in the industry is net 30, ask for net 15. 
Now you get to a point where like net seven becomes a little bit more aggressive, like maybe too aggressive, but you know, um, ask for it. Definitely ask for it. Um, and if it, yeah, if at all possible, it's funny. I, I, I did a project with, um, with a customer and I, you know, um, I, one great recommendation that I read in a book was, um, you know, uh, ask for the entire fee up front and give a discount. Like, so give them an option for, you know, a milestone based approach, but if they want to pay up front, give them 10% off hundred percent, you know, and so nine times out of 10 that you might be fine with that. Right. So I think that's something that you should definitely uh, ask for if that works out in your, in your, um, in your situation. Um, let's see anything else. I, I think I exhausted the, the, the questions on the, on the chat. Um, oh, Robert, uh, uh, we all try to, to, to write the to write great code, but there's sometimes defects get into, it gets into the live product. How would you recommend performing support after the project ended? That's a great, great question. So I think that, so I would, I would suggest that there's a um, warranty period for whatever you provide, right? Um, a lot of times, uh, you know, it, depends on sort of your business model. So if you're in the model where you want to deliver and you want to sort of walk away, um, then you do a code handoff with your customer, you do, you have a testing cycle and there might be like a 30 day warranty period. But after that warranty period, you're sort of done. Then I would suggest kind of structuring things that way and that they're sort of responsible unless, and this is kind of, I would treat this as a completely different relationship, unless they want to do a, like a support contract with you, right? So if, you know, they eventually want to do a support contract where it's like, you know, we, we do want to pay you sort of on a one-off basis. I, that makes sense to be hourly. Um, and so, because it's sort of like, again, ultra variation, just stuff happens. So um, I would sort of structure it that way. Try to delimit the scope for what you're going to deliver, deliver it, you know, um, test it, have them sign off on it. There's a little bit of a warranty period, but sort of ongoing support, treat that as a different um, engagement. Uh, what YouTube channel is this presentation going to be posted on? I think it's going to be on the, there's an ICS YouTube channel that the School of ICS is managing. So I think that's where that's going to be on. Um, uh, the alumni chapter, we're probably going to post it on um, LinkedIn on our uh, uh, social, but we may end up including uh, having a YouTube channel for ourselves as well. So a um, couple options there. Let's see, how do I join the alumni chapter? So um, I would say send an email. The email's not there. Email's in the front. Um, so send an email to um, UCI ICS alumni chapter at gmail.com and then we will connect you. There's a Slack channel, by the way, um, that um, uh, we've been trying to promote. Um, send us an email and we'll get you added to the Slack channel. Sort of the 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 vision for the Slack channel was to be able to collaborate, to have, um, you know, kind of even like a job board. If anyone has questions about stuff like, you know, just sort of one-off things about career and, and just sort of being an, an ICS alumni, um, we'd love to hear from you. And that's sort of a great channel, I think, uh, to, to do things like that on. Um, I guess I can end with this slide. So um, uh, our next event, Pooja, was, was that you? I didn't know if you're gonna, so there you go. So I think most of you should have gotten this email. It was sent out yesterday morning, Thursday morning. Um, if you're on the UCI ICS listserv, we've also posted it on Facebook as well as LinkedIn. Um, so again, we have all the social media platforms up and running. If you didn't get this link uh, or email, please send us a note on our Gmail account and we will get this to you. We are trying to uh, get a vanity Zoom account so that we can have a reoccurring meeting link, uh, but that is in the works right now. So each link is unique at this point. Uh, May the 4th. Please join us, dress up. We're going to have some games and it'll be interactive and more social. And we will continue to do these lunch and learns. We have some exciting lunch and learns ahead. So every Monday or Tuesday morning, you will receive emails. Um, so yeah. Very cool. Yeah. So, um, and 
and thank you so much for taking the time. I know uh, we were all super busy, so you know, um, uh, being able to uh, take the time with us is is great. Please, um, any sort of feedback that you have on content, um, on what you want to see, what is valuable to you as an alum, love would love to hear it. Um, and um, yeah, so I think we're at the end of our time together. So thank you very much. Um,